Maybe we should call maintenance. I'll fix it. I'm gonna fix it. Concentrate it. Maintain it. Maintain control. Maintenance complete. This is The Maintainers, a Blue Cap community podcast. My name is David Lee, director with Traction, and your host for The Maintainers Show. And I'm Jake Hall, the manufacturing millennial. On today's episode, we have a really special guest, Christian Olson, who is a mechanical engineer at AccuRide. And at 27 years old, we're going to hear a lot about his experience graduating, going right into the workforce right after the pandemic wrapped up. And we're going to learn about his experience in production maintenance, fluid design systems, CNC programming, product design, and of course, much more. Before that, a word from our sponsor. This podcast is brought to you by Traction. Traction offers streamlined hardware and software solutions designed to make maintenance more reliable and profitable. Their AI-powered condition monitoring and asset management solution predicts machine failures and unplanned downtime, allowing clients to save an average of $10 million every trimester. It's artificial intelligence quarterbacking your maintenance. Well, thanks for joining us, Christian. First off, how's your year going so far? Doing pretty all right. It's getting a bit colder here uh, up in, I live in, in north, Northwest PA, so it's getting, starting to get a bit chillier now. And you know, the summer's been busy so far this year. Uh, we went oh, out absolutely. to a lot of places. What was your, what was your favorite activity for the summer so far? Got a good story for us? Ooh, I spent a lot of the summer going to, I'm, I'm a nerd at heart. I went to a lot of conventions and things all around in Texas. I went to some out in Ohio, Pittsburgh, all over. Other than that, running, swimming, uh, a little bit of boating. So Christian, tell us a little bit about your background and essentially how you got started in the industry just in general. When I was younger, I, I pretty much, uh, my father was a, was a CNC programmer for a facility here, here in Northwest PA. And I grew up, you know, with him kind of seeing him do his work and, and what he did. And by the time I was out of high school, I was like, I, I think I want to do engineering. It wasn't, it didn't seem like the, the thing I wanted to do, but the more I learned and, and did more math and physics and things, I, I realized I, I'm good at this. I, it's what I enjoy. I, I love technology and learning new things. And that's an area where you can just constantly be learning new and new things because the science is developing as time goes on. Eventually ended up at Penn State Barrent in Erie, Pennsylvania. Thought I was gonna go for chemical engineering but ended up uh, switching to plastics engineering before eventually settling in the mechanical engineering uh, technology program there, uh, which I absolutely adored. And after that, I graduated just prior to the pandemic, actually. And that was an experience in and of itself, graduating, going, all right, let's get into the workforce. Let's, let's start the career. And then just a big old stop sign right in your face as, as March rolled around and all of a sudden no one, no one was hiring. It just, just grinded to a halt. I, I, I applied to, you know, went through and applied to jobs for, for months and months and months, but I, I kept on, you kept on that train, kept going and eventually was able to land a, uh, a production engineering, uh, position at Inscape in, uh, Faulkner, New York, uh, the U S branch of the company. And did a lot of CNC programming there, much like my father did, uh, as well as doing product design, uh, different projects, tooling design, until eventually, unfortunately, the company back in January of this year, unfortunately liquidated. I was, I was lucky enough that I actually, my, my current now, my current position at Accuride Wheels in uh, Erie, Pennsylvania, uh, I applied to it two days prior to that happening. And ended up landing the job that I'm currently at, getting a, you know, a higher position, a mechanical engineer too, have been, as much as I enjoyed the, the previous job, uh, feeling much more involved in what the company is doing, feeling like I'm able to challenge myself and learn new things and, and push the company that I'm working for forward and make big changes uh, in the place that I work, which is all you can really ask as an engineer is to to not just have busy work, to get that full experience of being the one that improves things and, and really makes a change. So as one of the younger guests that we've had so far on the podcast, 
What has been the perception of what you thought going into this industry was like versus what it actually was? And, and I know there's been a little bit of a shift. What were some of like the biggest, like, I guess you could say mind changes that you had with your own, you, you know, your own growth in that area? Definitely that, and, and I, I've seen this watching some of my other peers that also graduated around the same time I did. Sometimes it really is up to you to prove yourself and to push yourself to do more things for your company. Because uh, when I started at the at Inkscape originally, I came in and, and that, they were like, we are making a whole new product line. We need you to program all of it. My boss at the time was our only other person that could program CNCs and had basically been told by upper management, you are no longer an engineer, you are a manager. And so I came in and only having my CNC programming skills that I had basically learned in maybe two or so classes in, in school, you know, co covering the basics of, of, you know, G code and things like that, programmed an entirely new product line. Uh, but that was when I, when I came in and got that and, and I did all that and I was working on that for months and it, I was starting to get close to the end. And I, I come to them and I ask, Hey, what am I doing after this? Because, I, you know, I'm programming it to be variable. So once it's done, it's done. And then, you know, what's my job after that? Because at that point they hadn't given me anything else to do. And they were like, we'll figure something out for you. And immediately I'm <laughs> like, oh, okay. Well, I'm going to start coming up with ideas then. I, I need to be providing. I need to be doing right. something. Uh, that thought of just taking in the paycheck, not, not for me. And I do think going forward, you're probably going to feel a lot more fulfilled putting in that work and, and making that difference. And maybe you'll say, Here, here's the things that I've done. And I've had multiple projects that I've been able to do in my internships, but prior to graduating, as well as uh, in my job at Inkscape and Accurite, I've had projects that I'm like, I am, I'm proud of this and I'm very invested in, in what I did here. That's a really good point. And I want to see if you agree with this, because there's been a lot of studies recently that come out about happiness in the workplace and burnout and it they found that yeah. it's not actually being overworked or underpaid it's actually impact which causes people to have that that uh what we define as burnout and just have unhappiness in their role uh so it sounds like you're basically alluding to that and you're you're proof right like as, as they say the proof is in the pudding so good words there <laughs> good words there and so now that we know a little bit about christian uh it's time for our first segment maintainer mashup where we're going to dive into equipment management teams and find out what makes maintenance more reliable maintenance required listen i maintain i maintain myself maintain course maintain speed i gotta maintain respect and so christian working at accuride can we hear a little bit more specifically about Accuride and your day-to-day -day there. And for the audience, Accuride manufactures automotive parts like wheels, wheel ends, and brakes for commercial and passenger vehicles. So tell us a little bit about Accuride and kind of how things go there. We obviously see that you're a hard worker and, and you're, you're looking for that impact, but uh, let's break it down to a day-to-day. -day. So our specific plant uh, only does, we do aluminum forgings and machining of truck wheels. We've got quite quite the process. Uh, our, our forging process is not like any other process for for this specific thing. So with our with our forgings, uh, we actually only do one movement to uh, forge these wheels. If you go to just about anywhere else uh, that does does aluminum forgings or or forgings on the, our size, they don't do it in one movement. They they're going to do it in at least two or three two two or three different uh, for, like forms or parts to, to form it into its, its base shape. And that is a complex process, but we do do the forgings uh, to get the wheels in a uh, somewhat, if you were to look at it's from the side, like a hourglass shape uh, for the inside of the wheel. Uh, we spin them to put a bit more of a divot in. So it ends up like a curve, it's tighter curve in, slighter curve out. After that, it goes on to our lathes and machi our machine lines for lathing to clean it up after it's been heat treated, and then to add hand holes and uh, bolt holes. And then 
some some of our foragings go to our other facilities uh, in North America. But the majority of them end up just going straight out to consumers. And our facility nice. makes thousands of wheels a day. So it's it's a very big operation, uh, runs 24-7. So when you're doing this process that has a lot of heat, it's running really fast, yes. there's a lot, you know, there's a lot of, I guess you could say, you know, strength and pressure being applied to it. When you have those, you know, really unique pieces of equipment on the floor, how does AccuRide think about maintenance in terms of keeping the machines up and running, right? Because there's probably a risk if there is a failure to happen, it's yes. not just like the machine just turns off. There's, there, there's a, or probably a pretty big safety factor risk as well when it comes to handling this. How do you, how do you oh, as a yeah. company or how have you seen the culture around this type of process when it comes to like reliability and, and predictive maintenance? Yeah, so that is, that is, that is, a, that is certainly something that uh, companies can struggle with is, is getting that maintenance and that reliability when you have something that runs 24-7. Uh, right. Because we are, you know, not only do we supply ourselves with our own foragings, we also supply our other plants with their foragings. And so we really need to be on top of our production. Things can't stop. Things can't go down because not only will we be behind, they'll be behind and it just can cascade. And that is one of the things that I've I've been working on, the big project that I've been working on since I got to AccuRide and how I met. David uh, was working through Track Gym to get productive maintenance. And during my interview to start at AccuRide, my, my previous engineering manager, that was what he wanted, was, was in my first in interview was, hey, I want to do productive maintenance. Here's the technology. Is this something that interests you? And I said, absolutely. Like, <laughs> nice. I've never heard of this. I'm in. Like, absolutely, I'm in. I, I, I want to learn about this. I want to see what it can do. And I want to use it and improve our facility and our manufacturing process. And so what specifically about predictive maintenance in general excited you? So I know it, if we could see it in your eyes, right? The moment you got involved in reliability, it was something that sparked the interest. And obviously you are the tip of the spear, getting things done, getting projects actually inked and getting uh, sensors on different machinery projects done and things of that, of that nature. So what, what actually excited you? What was that spark? To be quite honest, just the fact that the general description of, of what my prior engineering manager had given me of seeing issues before they happen, you know, there was a specific issue. I believe it was a bearing in one of our, our big forges that uh, had gone down a few weeks before my interview to work there and that had gone down. And I think he said our forge was down for like a week because of this one bearing, because we just... No one, no one goes up there. These forges are three, three stories high. No one goes up there unless they have a very specific reason to go up there, which I actually, with, with installing Tractian sensors, actually had a reason to go up there. And it's <laughs> not fun going up there either. Uh, it's, a, it's a climb and uh, it shakes a lot. Right. You feel like you're in an earthquake. You know, it's, it's interesting, Kaya, how you talk about that. You know, when you're installing the sensors, I think there is probably like a... There, there's ways that you have to ensure there's uptime, right? Are there certain pieces when you were looking at getting more preventative maintenance, getting more information on the entire system that like you focused on specifically? You know, what was what was the low hanging fruit that you went after to start this process? I mean, immediately the low hanging fruit was I went to maintenance and said, "Hey, what do we have issues with the most? You know, out of stores, what what motors do we replace the most?" And then you look at some of the the big sort of uh, funnels in in how everything processes, like your factory, or like the the compressors for the entire factory. Right. Some things that if this breaks and if this goes down, it's everything goes down, or multiple things go down, and and you know are are harder to fix and puts a big halt in the process. Those those are how you kind of have to decide what to prioritize and, and what to focus on. And getting those can be very hard when you've just gotten there two weeks ago, uh, <laughs> figuring out uh, what, uh, what is most important. I haven't even figured out how to get where I'm going. I remember when I, when I first started the project, I found where, what I thought were our main compressors and wrote those down as, as all right, here's, what, here's where we want to put, put sensors on. 
And then later on, I was showing someone else and they were like, those, those are the backup compressors. The main compressors are in the other building. I'm like, oh, okay, good to know. Now, with this project, obviously there's things like access to heights and things where we're not wanting to go in dangerous yeah. areas all the time to kind of run these routes, right? But what are your biggest, I would say, hopes with respect to this predictive maintenance project, whether it be run times, reliability, improving mean times between failure, things like that? What for you is like, that's our big win, that's our home run, and this is what we're going for? I mean, the perfect world, the, the ideal is no unplanned downtime. That's the dream awesome. is, is to have it so that, uh, you know, you don't have a motor shut down. You're able to plan these because, uh, you know, you do preventative maintenance. That is, it, it's something that needs to happen. You should be doing it. In general, we try to do all of our machine lines and everything every mm -hmm. once every 30 days, at least. At, right. at minimum, do, do it once every 30 days. Okay. And... Even in that 30 day window, you can definitely have something that seemed fine before that all of a sudden isn't. And using the preventative maintenance, a motor on top of a CNC that no one's going to touch or look at, you know, it, it's just going to keep going uh, until it breaks. It, it, you know, until you're making bad parts and you're losing money. No one's going to look at it outside of a PM and uh, using predictive maintenance, being able to know ahead. Oh, hey, definitely look at this very specific thing during the next opportunity we have, because for the most part, if it's not showing any outward signs of wear, tear issues, no one's going to do anything about it. Mm -hmm. uh, they just go look at it and go, yep, that runs. Right. Uh, and, and using the predictive maintenance. You can, of course, see ahead of time and get a jump on it. So we've heard about how AccuRide operates and the systems they're using and solutions for predictive maintenance, but we want to dive more into the individual, which is you. So what is in Christian's toolkit? We're going to fix it. Get the tool. Pick the one right tool. The right tool for the right job. What are you doing? You know, you're, you're still really young in your career. You're 27 years yeah. old. You're on that cusp of millennial and Gen Z. What are you seeing as, you know, some of the, the things that manufacturers could be doing in general to make more young people like you being inspired to join this industry? You know, you had some time at Inkscape. What, what do you want to like share with, with other potential young generations or people who want to bring younger people on board? I actually, I've spent, uh, in preparation for this podcast, I actually talked to some other young engineers and got a lot of feedback in terms of, uh, you know, other experiences that people have had. Men, women, trans women, uh, LGBTQ, and got a lot of feedback in terms of what the experience has been. And in general, positive, very positive uh, for, for young engineers right now. There's all sorts of, of jobs out there in, in engineering to get. It's not you know, outside of the pandemic area, you can definitely find engineering positions in all sorts of uh, different fields, uh, whether it's exactly what you went to school for or, you know, trying to branch out and do and do other things. And that's that's something that I've I've personally tried to do is is I love new ideas and, and learning new things and expanding my skill set uh, as much as I can. Uh, because as, as one of my other peers put it, in five years time, there will be someone who can do what you do as good, maybe even better for cheaper, either because technology is improved and you never learned uh, what the new tech is, or you've somewhat started to settle, settle into your own, your own groove of how you do things and how you solve problems and expanding uh, what you're able to do uh, whether I, I've done CNC programming, I've done tool design, I've done product design, and just whatever whatever projects and anything I can get my hands on, uh, whether I'm, you know, the expert or not, if it's something that you can get your hands on and you can learn about and and prove that you can do that, it's incredibly important to get that opportunity for yourself. Well, I think it was one of those stories that you shared, right, where like you went out and you. You had to soundproof walls. I mean, yes. normally, normally yeah. soundproofing walls isn't, the, you know, a uh, a description that the engineer does, but that's something that yes. you had to learn 
that you've yes, never done that before. Was, yes, that was that was at Inkscape. Uh, we I started there, and we actually switched facilities. We we moved a few blocks away to a to a new facility. Inkscape made aluminum extrusions for glass walls. Uh, so basically, the framing for glass walls. Customers would send us their layout for what they wanted, like a floor plan to be, and then we figure out all the parts, like all the sizes of everything, and then mark everything with the appropriate numbers and just ship it off them and go, here's the Lego parts, here's exactly where they go, put it together. And we switched facilities. Mm-hmm. And we had a big stamp die machine. Or is it die machine? Uh, yeah. Flat so, st- yeah, thin like seal. A, a continuous stamping press or something. Yeah, it was t- yeah, basically. And it was, we, we had gone from a very large, you know, a much larger open facility to a much more condensed facility that had been it, it wasn't a manufacturing facility before it had just been a storage facility and the echo and the noise was atrocious we were way above osha standards for what was you know what was uh, safe to to be in that environment uh you could hear it from the office like the offices easily like it was just a constant noise and they wanted me to figure out a solution to this and I was lucky enough to have a an old family friend that worked as a that worked as a sound engineer, and I was like, "Hey, can give me some ideas? Like, I I need to learn about this. Like, let me know everything that you can give me in like a a three hour period that it, to at least get me started." And basically got the the descriptions of you know you've got to look up these specific like what these materials are for how they react to echoes and and reflect noise I, and and the best. He's like, you don't need to seal it in. You just need to make sure that the echo doesn't hit a hard, heavy wall. Because that that was the issue, was it was it was just bouncing back and forth in this in this small location. And so using just old materials that we still had laying around from the previous facility and the previous product lines that we had, had stopped making. Uh, was able to, I, I looked up what mat- what the materials were, like the, the different specs about them, and was able to basically make these soundproofing walls that we placed around three sides of it, uh, of this of the stamping machine, and was able to get that decibel level below OSHA regulations, which saved our company money because we no longer had to go through, uh, you know, the necessary sound, you know, uh, sound safety and and a whole bunch of other things that were that were going to be an extra headache that we were going to have to spend extra money on. Well, you got to be flexible in a lot of those areas, yeah. and, and I think that's kind of why you know we need, we move into our third segment here, which is where we talk about you know the future of factories. Meet the future to our futures. What future? The factory. My factory. Everybody's factory. I love your factory. My factory. My walls. We always think of. Trends are changing. The way we're doing business is changing, and the way we need to, you know, look ahead is, is constantly changing as well. Especially when you know the industry wants to bring in younger generations. They want to bring in different ways of how they're working, how they're learning. So, what do you see? You know, has been the biggest challenge with you know older teammates, older people in maintenance. You know, who I guess you could say the industry veterans of the company, and yes. how. I guess you could say change has been affecting them as new technology, new trends, new people join the yeah. industry. So, so that, yeah, that is a, that is a big, big thing. Uh, I mean, that's, that's, that's a tale as old as time of, of uh, just in general, new things aren't always uh, the easiest to come, you know, just with, with age, you new things aren't as simple or aren't always as accepted. Uh, and I feel like that's just a natural part of life. Like that, you know, that goes as back as, as uh, back to things like, you know, rock and roll being the the speech of the devil. And, you know, it, it's just, it's a natural part of the human experience. And that can seep its way into the actual industry and, and manufacturing things like that uh, in terms of technology, where you've got, for example, like a guy who's been on the floor uh, doing maintenance work for maybe like basically his whole life since his 20s. He's been at the same, you know, been at the same facility maybe 30 40 years uh still there and totally comfortable wants things how to stay how they are and 
getting those people on board can some is often uh, with new technology and new ideas is going to be the hardest thing for you to do, especially as, as a younger engineer. If you don't have all of your bases covered for all of your reasoning and why it and why you do what you do. Uh, and that especially can become an issue, uh, you know, with management, uh, not necessarily because management is negative or, or they don't know what they're doing, uh, but just because uh, they really want to see proof that things will work correctly. They don't, they don't want to, you know, they don't want to spend money on something that is just a flight of fancy, uh, which is totally understandable. That's, you know, that's how industry works and how you make money. And in terms of tech and, and pushing those sort of things, uh, and especially once a facility or a, a facility gets its own sort of work culture uh, in terms of how everyone acts, what, you know, like the general feel of like, how do the guys that work on the floor talk to each other about work when they're in the lunchroom? If you can hear one of those conversations, you can have an immediate idea of how that facility runs and how easy it is to get people to do things and to feel fulfilled in their job or feel like they want to do a good job. And that can, you know, the, the mental game makes a huge difference. All right. So in light of that a question here, what can we do more as an industry to make things more inclusive for all types of people to attract more workers to come in to help? Um, I understand that you definitely spent some time speaking with with some of your peers and things. So give us a little bit of a uh, of knowledge there on what they're thinking and kind of what your uh, your perspective is on this, so we can improve this really as a community and as an industry. Well, at least from a social aspect, especially for young engineers. I mean, you've got we, we live on for you know, it, it, unfortunately, we do live in a very political era where people have very very strong beliefs and. You know, as new parts of culture pop up or become more accepted, the older generations have a hard time, can have a hard time adjusting to that. And that can especially be true in areas like LGBTQ, trans employees, or even just women employees, unfortunately. Uh, women engineers, I have some, you know, a good amount of peers that I went to school with that I still, you know, I'm in contact with and still friends with that I, I've spoken to them about their experiences since they started in their careers. And while it's very generally a very, you know, positive, they're all very, very strong willed and hard workers. They've still had very, you know, very specific, sometimes very specific, very negative situations, sometimes outright, but a lot of the times subconscious sort of reactions from older, older uh, men engineers. Absolutely. I think the thing is, right, if the industry needs to grow, so does, you know, what the people in the industry look like as well. Right. We're not going to yes. have growth yes. if if we're stagnant in what it currently is, you know. Yes. So so as we kind of wrap things up, we're going to move into the final segment, which, you know, before we say goodbye, we call it the fix it funny. Fix is in. It's making a really funny noise. I'm going to fix it. Make it funny would be great if you could make it funny. Your fate is fixed. So makes it funny. Make sure it's funny. So these are just some fun uh, takeaways that we have right now. So I guess if you were in this industry, if you were in manufacturing and maintenance, what industry would you want to be a part of? If I wasn't in engineering, I want to say I'd still probably want to be in a medical field. That was that was still, even though I, I veered away from that a little bit uh, as I got older, uh, the idea of, you know, helping people, that, that was still always... Uh, you know, whether it be straight up, you know, doctor, nurse, anything like that, or uh, EMT worker, like psychologist, uh, counselor, any anything like that, uh, of just anything that could help people. Like that, that that has always been my my primary uh, drive as a person is is improving lives. So, is there any um, piece of content right now that you're consuming, like Netflix or Disney Plus, or reading a book? Is there any uh, show that you're enjoying watching right now? To be honest, I don't watch a ton of TV. Okay. Uh, I'm I've always just been more of a read read books or or games and stuff like that. I'm not usually much of a, a passive 
experienced type of person. So final question, if there was any piece of equipment that you could run or you could work on, what would that be? I wish I could go back and uh, run the equipment that I designed for uh, my senior project in the industry, uh, the fluidization system that I designed for my senior project for, for a company. Uh, I was able to you know, make the design and everything and push that onto them uh, by the end of the summer. But I was never able to actually, I was able to see some of the, the prototypes we made in action, but never the proper system and I, I, the, you know, that's, that's something I really wish that I, I could, I could have seen in person. All right. Well, thanks again for coming, Christian. It has been absolutely yeah. wonderful to have you. This has been The Maintainers, a Blue Cap Community podcast. Don't forget to subscribe wherever you get your podcast, as we are on most major platforms so you don't miss an episode when we go live. This podcast is brought to you by Traction. Traction offers streamlined hardware and software solutions designed to make maintenance more reliable and profitable. Their AI-powered condition monitoring and asset management solution predicts machine failures and unplanned downtime, allowing clients to save an average of $10 million every trimester. It's artificial intelligence quarterbacking your maintenance.